You know, it's interesting. Uh, last time I was here, I, I told you guys about the young man who had been murdered um, at our local park and the three murders that have taken place in the last couple months in our community or the last couple weeks, realistically. I don't know if you guys watched the news. Uh, West Ranch was in the news again, all right? Um, this time, more so as a community trying to band together to fight the violence in our space, right, in our neighborhood. There were a lot of good things you could take away from it, a lot of, like, really this is the best we have to offer. Um, we're a community of roughly 25,000 people. We could only get 200 people to show up. On the bright side, you say 200 people showed up, right? That's the most anyone has ever, that's the most people have ever showed up at a meeting like this. But when you take into account, there's 25,000 of us, and only 200 showed up. Like the question you have to ask is, do we really want to stop the violence? And I'm that guy, right? I'm that guy that asks that question, like, do we really want to stop the violence if only 200 of us, right? It's that whole 80 20 thought process, right? 20% of the people do 80% of the work. Like, that can't be the reality for us. And, uh, and so we were on the news, uh, KCRA 3 and Fox 40. HBO was there doing a documentary on our mayor. So, I don't know if that's a good thing. Uh, but we were there. Uh, yours truly got to open the meeting in prayer, which was really awesome. Uh, as the community pastor, I got to pray for the meeting to be opened. And now, West Branch, our open door is starting a um, kind of a prayer group that we go out once a month and pray for different spaces in our, our area, right? Like, Western Ranch is a real bad part of our town, our, our little area. And so um, we're gathering people, and we're not even ask, necessarily asking for Christians, right? We're just asking for people who want to bring our community before the feet of God and say, let's pray um, over our community, over our children, over our neighbors. And so I want to welcome if any of you guys want to come out and pray with us, we'd love to have you. Uh, we're going to do every second Thursday of the month at 7 o'clock, um, we'll have different locations that we'll meet at, there's different spaces need prayer. Um, but this coming October 11th, right, it's the second Thursday, we're going to be at the uh, Food for Less um, in our neighborhood. And try to see what that looks like, right? But just bringing our space before the feet of God. And, uh, and so if you don't want to join us, I get it. It's far, right? It's 30 miles. Um, but be praying for us while we pray for others. Um, at least join us in, in the time of prayer over our community. Um, yeah. So we're going to continue through Acts. And, and a couple weeks ago, I had asked you guys, or maybe a couple months ago, I had asked the question, like, do we really believe the stuff that is written here? Like, really? Like, do we really believe the things that are written on these pages? Because we had talked about, you know, pick up your cross, right, daily. That means we're picking up instruments of death every day to follow Christ. Do we really believe the stuff that is written? And so there's another question I want you to ponder as we think about this too is 
Have you ever thought that maybe we don't look like the people we read about in here? Do we look like these people that we read about? Or not? And you might think you do. Awesome. High five. Love you. But if you don't, why not? And this is a question that I wrestle with as I walk through the book of Acts at Open Door, right? Open Door is walking through the book of Acts as well. Um, but as I walk through the book of Acts, I, I always ask the question, like, man, why can't we do what they're doing? Why isn't my shadow healing people? Why can't I say, I don't have gold and silver, what I do have, I give to you, now get up and walk. What's wrong with me? Or us? Why does it not look the same? And so I just want you to think about those things as we read this next section of text. Do you guys show the text up here? No, good. I'm going to start back at verse 1 of chapter 1, and I want to read all the way through the first chapter. And it says, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared, over to them. he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times and four dates the father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said. Why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives. The Sabbath walked away from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, <coughs> Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers, the scriptures had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through the mouth of David concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus, he was one of our number and shared with this ministry. But the reward he got for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this. So they called that field in their language, the Kelamah, that is, filled with blood. For said, for said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms. May his place be deserted, that there be no one to dwell in it. And may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord went in and out among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must be a witness with us of his resurrection. So they promised, proposed two men, Joseph, Paul Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. 
show us which one of these two you have chosen to take over the apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, so he was added to the eleven apostles. Let us pray. Father, we come and we're so grateful for who and what you are, the way that you work, the things that you do. Lord, we pray that it's your words that are spoken to your children. We pray that you are honored and glorified to the fullest. We pray that you help us to hear the things you need us to hear today. We pray that you open us up to whatever you have for us and close to whatever is not of you. We surrender all that we are to you. We can't do this without you, Lord. We thank you and we praise you in the mighty name of Jesus. So backtracking just a little bit for those who weren't here uh, roughly two weeks ago, uh, we opened this section of scripture, Acts chapter 1, and, and talked about what Jesus is doing when he is getting ready to ascend from the disciples, right? We talked about how Jesus was taken into custody, he was beaten, he was crucified, and he rose again. And in the rising again, he would spend days with the disciples and and we get the picture that it wasn't every day, but he would appear. And every time he appeared, he had to convince them that he was who he said he was. Right? He said that he had to convince with many proofs that he was Jesus. Right? And, and, I, was, and, I, and I told you, I was like, I struggle with that. Like, I struggle with that thought. Like, why does Jesus got to keep proving himself to them? But, right? You don't want to follow a false teacher. Right? So, yeah. If you got it, man, let's see it. Show me. Right? Show me. You are who you say you are. And so he would prove himself to them and then he would sit down and he would teach them. And as he was teaching them, he said, don't leave Jerusalem until the gift my father has promised that you've heard him talk about has come upon you. Don't leave until the Holy Spirit comes to you. And think about that, right? And I'd ask the question, like, what does that look like for us? Like, don't leave. I'm not going to give you a time frame of what that looks like. I'm not going to tell you how long you have to wait. Because if you're anything like me, I need time frames. Right? I got a schedule I got to keep. I got things I got to do. Right? Kids that got to get picked up or fed or put to bed. Right? Like, I have all these things. Right? A wife that needs a few minutes of my time every day. So, Jesus, how long are you talking? I got to hang out here. Do I get to leave it all? Do I got to come? Right? Like, these are all the things that I that would be running through my head. Um, and we see in Scripture so many times that when someone speaks and they tell them to do something, there is no questions asked. It's, yes, let's just follow, let's just go and do what you said, right? Abraham, uh, God comes to Abraham and says, leave your family and go to the place that I will show you. And I always ask the question, like, what did that conversation look like with Sarah? Honey, uh, this God that we don't know just spoke to me. And said, we need to leave. But where are we going? I don't know. He just said, just pick up and go. Leave everything behind. Now, if your wife or anything like my wife, my wife's like, uh, uh, we ain't just picking up and going. We got jobs over there. Is there a house for us to live in? Right? We got things. We got some things that we need to be able to do what we got to do. Like, where are we going to get food from? Like, all these questions. What did that conversation look like? But they picked up and left. There was this trust of just doing. And so as they're sitting there and God tells them, don't leave. They said, well, is this the time that we're going to be, it's going to be revealed that you're going to come back and you're going to change the world and you're going to save us and all this stuff? And God's like, don't worry about that. Let me tell you what you got to worry about. And this is the whole thrust of the book of Acts. Like, this is what the book of Acts lives on. This verse right here, verse that he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you'll be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the rest of the world. Don't worry about that other stuff. Here's what you need to worry about. Power is coming. You have a job to do. 
You know, it's interesting that it's written that way. Uh, um, when Hanford came down, Hanford uh, CRC came down, they, they brought a youth group team. Um, I, there was a girl who was a part of the group, and she belonged to another church, but she liked the youth group, right? And she's like, hey, I got a missionary friend who's getting ready to go away. He's selling these sweaters. Or, Would you like one? I'm like, sure, I'll buy a sweater. I'll support a missionary. I'm a missionary, right? So I'll support How much? She's like, oh, it's like 40 bucks. Cool. So she said, she's she really going to like it. I was like, all right, cool. So I get the sweater, right? And on the front it says commission. All right? It says commission. On the back, it says option, crossed. Opinion, crossed. Suggestion, crossed. It says command. And then underneath it says go. I was like, ooh, I like this sweater. I'm going to rock this everywhere, right? Because I don't know if we understand truly what's going down, but there's this command that God has given, right? It's not an option for us to say, well, I don't know if I really want to witness for you, Jesus. I don't know if I really want to go where you tell me to. No, it's not an option. It's not something we get to negotiate with. It's a command. Here's the even crazier part. It's the last thing Jesus says to them. When he said that, he was gone. They didn't need to go, whoa, 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 time out for this, no, no, Who do we go in Jerusalem? Do we talk to anybody? Who's, who's lead? Who's point? What organization are we going to use, right? Like, all these questions. What program are we going to work through? What literature do we say, this is the instructions of how we do this? He just took off, and they all watched. And as they watched, the angels came down and go, hey, why are you guys watching, man? He said you got a job to go do, now go do it. He's going to come back. And that's why I ask the question, do we believe everything that's written in there? Because what are your expectations, right? Today, the, the topic is expectations. What are your expectations? Because I think our expectations are dictated by how we believe what's written here. My expectations are based on how I understand the gospel of Jesus. Those are where my expectations come from. Because when Jesus says, go, do this, do that, can I do it? And if I can, why can't I? And if I can't, why can't I? What fears or thoughts or emotions or, or circumstances or situations are preventing me from being able to go and do the things Christ says? He says, go, be a witness. Go and be my witness, right? And we talked about what that looks like, right? And I don't know if you know what a witness is, but when you go to the court of law and you are called as a witness, it's because you've seen something and you are being asked to testify about that thing. You're being asked to tell people what you saw. If we took the Greek word, right, we talk about this too, the Greek word is martyr. Well, what we understand martyr to be is someone who dies for a cause. So the word, Greek word of witness has become our martyr because we testify about things, we talk about it even unto death. Even if it means our life, we talk about it. We talk about it. I ask people all the time, what's the most important thing in your world? And if the first response out of your mouth is not Jesus, it's the wrong one. Sorry. Because if it's not, then I'm not willing to do anything unto death for him. I'm not. I'm not. Maybe you are. Maybe he can be second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth in your, on your list, but you're still willing to die for. If it's not number one, I'm not. And so I have to ask the question, like, what prevents Jesus from being number one in my world when I think about what he has done for me, right? That he was willing to go up on the cross and take nails in his hands and be beaten and stabbed and punished and mistreated when I did not want nothing to do with him, when I was hostile to him, right? He says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. He still went up and took it all. Took it all. And that's why I said the expectations I have are come out of the understanding that I have of what happened there. 
How do I understand that? And how grateful can I truly, I, and I don't know about you, but when I do something for somebody, I expect a little bit of gratitude, just a little bit. Just tell me thank you. That's all I want. Give you a few dollars, help you out, give you a ride, feed you. I just want to thank you. Could you imagine what I would be asking for if I gave my life for you? Woo! I want total allegiance. I want the next 25 kids you have to be named after me. Like, like, that's just the way I think of it. When we think about what Jesus did, can I fully understand the gravity of it? He went on the cross and died for me. That's, like one of, that's why one of the things I always say is, if we could just understand the amount of grace that it took in order for us to have the life that we live today. And I say us, I'm included. But if I knew the amount of grace that it took for me to have the life that I live today, and I could give that to someone else, I could change the world. I could. Now imagine 12 people doing that. Oh, it happened. The disciples did it. They changed the world. Because they knew the amount of grace that it took for them to live the life that they do. So our text today, Jesus floats up. And the angel's like, what are you doing? What do they do? Like, what is your thought process, right? When you think about your expectation, what are you doing? Jesus just left. The angel just said, get to work. Oh man, he's gone now. Hey, let's go back to the house. There's something more. Hey, the Niners are playing. The Niners are playing right now. The Niners are playing. Let's go watch the game. Oh, it's lunch time. Let's go eat. All right? What's your expectations of what, what? What is it that we do in response to when Jesus leaves? What do the disciples do? They go back to Jerusalem to the upper room. Nobody knows what upper room it is. I like to believe that this is the upper room that Jesus told them and washed their feet and fed them and said and gave them the new uh, <coughs> the new communion uh, standards and, and told them about the Holy Spirit. Like, this is the room they're going back to, right? That's what I like to believe. I could be wrong, but they go back. And they begin waiting. They begin waiting. Like, nothing else matters. Nothing else. Nothing else mattered. I think about that. Like that was their response. Their response was, let's go do what Jesus just said and wait. Because when his power comes, we're gonna run with it. We're gonna run with it. And this is that they began to consistently uh, Hang out with each other in prayer. Oh my goodness. What does a life committed to prayer look like in a group of people? It might be easy to say I have a prayer life myself, or maybe me and my spouse have a prayer life, but what does it look like when a community of people come together consistently for prayer? What does that look like? Here's what they were doing, right? It says there was 120 of them. 120 people gathering to pray together. Consistently. I don't know what that means all day. I don't know what that means every, you know, uh, every day at 6 o'clock. I don't know what that means once a week. I don't know. I don't know. But they got together to pray. What were they praying for? God prepares for when his power comes. That we can handle it. That we can be faithful with it. That we can do all the things that you asked us to. Did anyone say, I hope I get to be the super villain? <laughs> right? I take over the world. I see, I think this is the key, and, I, and you guys will hear me say it when we get a little further into Acts, man, and I start talking about Peter and what happened to Peter, because like Peter, Peter like changed night and day from where he was prior to Acts 1 to where he is come Acts 2. Night and day different. 
and it's roughly 50 days, right? So what happened in the transition of those 50 days? But they began to pray. What are our expectations? When Jesus tells us to go out and be witnesses, do we believe that he's really going to be there for us? Do we believe, believe that he's really never going to leave us or forsake us? We believe that he's going to give us some words to say because he says he will. Do we believe? Do we know that Jerusalem is this area they're in? Judea is the surrounding areas. Samaria is probably another part of the state, maybe another state away. The answer of the world is another country. Do we realize Jerusalem is the place they killed Jesus, right? What does that look like to, for you to stay somewhere where your loved one, your Lord, was just killed in front of you? And you're probably on the hook too. Do you want to stay there? Do you want to minister to these people? I deal with people who have had people killed all the time, right? And I, have, and I go to court with them and I see the way other families react sometimes. And it's, it's hard, right? Because you've got, they're hurting and they're in pain, but they want like this other person to suffer and be punished for the death that they committed. And now here you are being told by Jesus, your Lord, to stay here and witness to them. Jesus, don't you know what they just did to you and I had to watch it? Judea, they weren't welcome to either. They ran out of there. Imagine having to go away to some people you're not welcomed by. Samaria. Those are half-breeds, man. Those aren't even real Jews. They're not even like us. They're bottom of the barrel. Can you minister to people you think you're better than? Who are not like you? I might be the only person that thinks like that. There are some people that, unfortunately, I do think I'm better than sometimes. I do find weakness moments of that. Damn, why can't you just figure it out? Until the ends of the earth. Now you're dealing with a whole other group of people. These are Gentiles. They don't speak the language. They don't have their God. And here he is telling you, go and minister. Can we do it? Like, what are our expectations, God? I don't know. Because if I don't do it, like, you're at, what I always say is our expectations are shown in the way we live. And so if I'm not doing it, it's because I don't believe it. I'm not telling you I do. But my life ain't showing it. It's not. And if my life isn't showing it, can I tell you that I believe it? Can I tell you that? Can I tell you that I believe if my life says something to the contrary? And that's why I asked the question. Like, I think our expectations come out of how we understand what's written here. Like, how do I understand it? How do I hear the things that Christ says? Like, do I really believe that if I give up everything for you, my life is truly going to be better? But then there's a redefinition of what better looks like. It has to be. Because I think better is I get to go on vacation whenever I want. There's no money's not a concern. I don't have to scrape pennies together in order to be able to buy the things that I need while I'm on vacation. Because I live this life, right? I gotta scrape pennies in order to like buy food when I'm on vacation. Like that's the good life. But now you're asking me, Christ, to give up everything that I desire for me to do what you want. Like, that's the hard question. That's when faith hits the rubber, hits the road. Can I do it? Yeah, check it out. You 
can. You know why? Because we got power. We got power. He says it. Do we believe what's written in here? You receive power. smoking, we're not selling. If you don't like it, you can leave because he's not. It's like, ooh, right? This is just what we do, where we hang out. We love all people. And this was the result of it. Well, his family got arrested, right? If you guys remember the sexiest criminal in history from Facebook, that guy was raided at their house. I guess he gets the phone call at 7.30 in the morning when the police are kicking me in the house. It's me and I walk out there in shorts and a white beard and my flip flops on them. Hey, what's going on? They just took them to jail. They just took them. They just took them to jail. They just took them to jail. I'm like, all right, I'll go and check them out. And they get out. We fight the case. They him and his son get out. And him and his family, they were section eighters at the time, so they got put out of their house. Section eight, you can't get arrested or have drugs or have guns and stuff. And it's funny to talk about because he walked to my driveway. I was at the church house working out, and he walks up. Hey, Pastor. Long time no see. I'm like, man, where you been? He's like, I'm on the east side now. But I had to come over here and say hello. I'm like, man, what's up? Let's kick it. What? What you need? How can I help you? I just need to talk to you. All right, I got you. And that was the fruit of trusting what God says, right? Go out into the world and be a witness. Because I trust that God is going to do for me exactly what he said. He's, he's never let me down. I don't know if he's ever let you down. But he's never let me down. And I want to be the first one to tell you that God doesn't let us down. He so doesn't let us down. As a matter of fact, that he went to the cross to die for us even while we didn't want nothing to do with it. While we were still hostile to him. Lying, spitting, all the things we do. What are your expectations of him? Of what he says? I honestly tell you guys, wherever, wherever they are, it's okay. It's okay. Wherever your expectations are, 
expectations are right at this moment, it's okay. Why? Because we can always move forward. We can. Wherever you are, there's no reason to be ashamed, there's no reason to feel guilty, there's no reason to feel bad. None. Because we can move forward. We have each other. And that's why when I come here, I got to promote like community, right? That's in our name. Community. Let's get out, let's high five, let's handshake, let's hug, let's knuckle bump, right? Let's do all that. Let's be family. When I'm family, I conquer the world. Because not only do I have the power of God behind me, but I have the power of love of each and every single one of you. That if anything ever happens to me, I know you guys will take care of me. I know you guys will love me. I know you guys will help my family. I know it. The same things that you desire for you, I desire for me, so we desire for each other. Because God put that in us. He put it there. So, whatever it is that you're struggling with, that's creating barriers between you and God, between you and the community, between you and, and everything else. Start praying about it. Start talking about it. Start walking through it. Start addressing it. And realistically, God just wants to be first and foremost in your world. He does. He does. And I like to believe that's why we're here today. Because we too want God to be first and foremost in our world. And if you don't, that's perfectly okay too. We can chat about it. Because I love you. There's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing you can do about how much I love you. In the same way, there's nothing you can do about how much he loves you. Nothing. When that love becomes a part of who we are, out there, there's nothing they can do about how much we love them. Nothing. Let's pray. Father, we come and we're so grateful for who and what you are, the things that you do and the ways that you work, Lord. And, oh, and your love is so amazing, Father. It's so great. It's so powerful. It's so awesome. There's nothing like it. And, Father, I pray that as we begin to embrace your love for us and the amount that you pour out upon us and that you give it to us even when we don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. It's not based on how good I can be, how, how nice I can be. It's just about the fact that you love me unconditionally. Father, I pray that wherever we are, that we can trust you. And when we struggle with you, we can talk to you about it and, and yell at you and be emotional with you and just let you know where we are. And then you can say, it's okay. I love you. I pray, Father, wherever each and every single person is in here, Lord, and you know it, that you surround them with men and women of God that can walk with them, that can talk with them, that can share with them, that can love on them, that can just be the hands and feet of you to them, so that one day they will be able to do it for someone else. We can't do this alone. We need you. So we call upon you. We call upon your power. We call upon your authority. We call upon everything that you have to give to strengthen us where we can build us up when we're torn down. We love you, Father. And praise all in the name of my Jesus. Amen.